Like auto encoders, which are in <coughs> essentially infinite mixture models using uh, deep neural networks. We've seen uh, generative adversarial networks, which are defining a sampling process and implicitly representing a distribution uh, you're interested in, and especially su they are su especially successful in representing uh, or producing high fidelity data. With neural distribution estimators, which decompose your joint distribution according to the ch uh, chain rule of probability and representing conditional distributions with neural networks. We've seen normalizing flows which warp a simple dis samples from your, a simple distribution like a Gaussian into your target distribution using a stack of invertible neural networks. And we've seen uh, some product networks, which are, in a nutshell, a deep generalization of mixture models, or if you want to see them also as a neural network, they're essentially combining three simple concepts. So you provide as a user simple distributions over small subsets of random variables, and you essentially glue them together with factorizations. These are the product nodes in some product uh, networks uh, and mixing distributions. So each neuron in some product network, if you want to see this as a neural network, is a fa factorization node, a product node, or a sum node, a, a mixture node. And essentially by playing around with factorization, mixing in a nested recursive manner and capturing this recurs recursive nested manner with an R-cyclic directed computation graph, that's roughly what a sum product network is. And you might say, hold on, so VAEs, GANs, NADES, and flows, I would asso associate them with uh, deep learning, but not so much some product networks. And that's essentially precisely the point uh, of this paper. So we want to argue that we actually can make them more similar, uh, that, that we can use some product networks for deep learning. And there's a good reason why we want to use them, uh, why we would like to use some product networks over the other models. And the reason can be summarized with uh, inference. So all of these models, uh, the, uh, I show here again these uh, five models I uh, presented on the previous slides. All of these models essentially do the same job. They represent a high dimensional probability distribution and uh, to s are more or less successful to capture uh, probability distribution from data. So that's good. But probabilistic reasoning and probabilistic reasoning uh, representing and learning distributions is only part of the story. The other part of the story is um, Uh, another, uh, the other part of the story is inference. So you want to ask questions to your model, right? So, and while it's hard to say what inference in full generality is, we might be inter interested in certain inference routines or primitives. So how do these models uh, compare when we want to draw samples? So good news, all of these models support to draw new unbiased samples from the represented distribution. <coughs> which is good, so we, in principle we can do Monte Carlo integration for inference. But how about density evaluation? So say if you want to compare two samples, which, which one is more likely? So GANs typically don't have a density, VAEs do have a density, but it's hard to compute. Flows, NADES, and SBNs can, by construction, efficiently evaluate the density of a sample. What about marginalization? And if you if you are allowed to take only one inference routine, it probably should be marginalization. So it pops up in Bayes' rule. Essentially, marginalization is one of the key routines in, in inference. So actually, bad news for uh, the typical deep learning probabilistic uh, models, uh, but SPNs, and that's essentially the superpower, they can perform arbitrary marginalization of your thousand-dimensional random vectors. You can get arbitrary sub-marginals, essentially at the same cost as evaluating um, uh, the density, so essentially just performing a feed, uh, feed forward pass. I don't go into details here, but uh, just let it be said that this is easy in SPNs. Uh, similar for conditioning, so you can uh, get, if you have a, a density model represented by an SPN, you can come up with arbitrary conditioning uh, distributions. So you get all of the conditionals, essentially with two network passes. Uh, you can also compute moments uh, in polynomial time in full generality. However, maximizations of finding a probability maximizing assignment on, under your model is also hard in SPNs, unless, as we've uh, learned yesterday, you can impose uh, further constraints on the model, then also this is a tractable inference routine. So it looks good for SPNs, and essentially the question is, so why aren't they more used as a deep learning model? And uh, so our conjecture is essentially, I've told you that uh, SPNs are essentially uh, is a recursive nested arrangement of factorization and mi uh, mixing. And therefore, 
you can, you're actually free to play around with the structure and input distributions of your SBNs, uh, but you have to satisfy a certain structural constraint called uh, completeness and decomposability. And as we've learned yesterday in the uh, tutorial on probabilistic circuits, these are essentially the minimal requirements. There are further constraints you can put on uh, some product networks or more generally probabilistic circuits, and then you get rewarded with further tractable inference routines. But you have at least completeness and decomposability, which actually just ensure that product nodes are proper factorizations and uh, some nodes are proper mixtures. So, however, the, the main insight for this paper is that these structural constraints kind of are, are an obstacle for, uh, in the practical use of SBNs. And what people, people typically do is they learn the structure uh, from data, and therefore, to represent SBNs, they write their, their custom so, uh, software, run it in CPU, and that just doesn't really go well together with deep learning, which typically runs on TensorFlow or PyTorch. So the idea is essentially let's forget about structure learning, just take a randomized structure <coughs> in a scalable manner. So come up with a random procedure to come up with a random uh, SBN of arbitrary size and just fit parameters. So implement the thing on uh, TensorFlow, use GPU support, Autotiff, and the like. Um, so pretty straightforward idea, so here's how we do it. So in order to come up with a random some product network, we go uh, via a more general representation of some product network called a region graph. And a region graph is simply a graphical uh, description of, uh, uh, of the compositions of your variable scope. So let me just explain uh, w without going too much into detail. So a region in a region graph is, um, is a subset of random variables you're interested in. And in this example, we are modeling seven random variables, x1 to x7, and that's the so-called root region of a region graph. And in, on, in our process, we just start with, we just randomly split this, uh, this uh, re root region, so this set of random variables, into non-overlapping sets of random variables. So for each random variable, we flip a, a, a fair coin. If it shows hats, it goes into the right re uh, subregion. If it shows tail, it, it goes into the uh, left subregion. So the bright boxes are, here are regions, which are just subsets of your variable scope, and the dark boxes are partitions. So we split our, our, our root region into two parts, and we just recursively repeat this until a certain split depth D. So D is a hyperparameter of this process. We can do this now a second time, or more generally R times, so we can uh, grow our region graph so we can have multiple recursive splits attached to the root region. So uh, R is a second hyperparameter here. So after we have con uh, constructed our random region graph, we can now com take this region graph and compile it into an SPN, and we do this as follows. So first we spend um, uh, a number of uh, input distributions for each of these root regions, and in our work we uh, use something simple like the, uh, uh, Gaussians with diagonal covariance matrices or factorized uh, discrete distributions. Uh, after that, we spend a set of sum nodes for each of the internal regions. For the root region, we take uh, Z sum nodes, where Z denotes a number of classes. This subsumes density estimation, where Z is one, so essentially density estimation can be seen as a one-class uh, 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 model. If we have a classification problem, we would lay, say, three classes, we would take th uh, three sum nodes. After that, we take simply for, uh, for each partition, we take cross products of the, of the nodes which are uh, in the, in the subregions of the, of the partition, and finally we connect the products as uh, children of the parent sum nodes. So a very simple mechanical way to come up with a random uh, uh, some product network, and by playing around with hyperparameters, you can essentially pretty scale this. So we train, uh, after constructing this random structure, we uh, train this with either maximum likelihood using the EM algorithm or simply Adam and uh, optimize cross entropy. We also consider a hybrid uh, objective trading off between the generative and the discriminative uh, domain. So how does this work? Here are 20 data sets which are widely used in uh, the SBN literature and we compare with the most prominent uh, learning algorithm Learn SBN with uh, learn SBN where a subroutine was uh, uh, replaced by a random uh, procedure. So essentially, the, if you are familiar with learn SBN, we took random partitions for the product nodes here. Uh, 
we compared with a small random SBN. So there's one other method in literature which also considers random SBNs, but rather small ones and uses Bayesian moment matching for parameters and with our random SBNs, so abbreviated with as rat SBNs. So all of the, these models on the left-hand side, they use single variate input distributions, so, uh, so uh, Bernoulli, essentially, and we also compare with ID SBN, which does an additional trick, so it is also indirect, so it uses um, input leaves over larger scopes and uses small Markov networks, so it does something extra here. So the main comparison is on the left-hand side, and what we see, so the, this is test likelihood, and we see that when we compare RAT SBN, say, with learn SBN, is that on many of these data sets, we are actually uh, comparable or sometimes even better. And that even though we just simply did no structure learning at all. So essentially, this can, could mean two things. So either these data sets are too simple, too simple-minded, and maybe we should, I, I agree with Antonio yesterday in the tutorial, we should spend some effort and come up with some more interesting uh, data sets, uh, benchmarks for SBN comparison. So either these data sets are too simple or it could mean that many data sets are of the nature that you can actually crack it with a random structure. So this is essentially the insight for the generative uh, domain. We also uh, trained them as classifiers so, uh, you, uh, on, on cross entropy or the, our hybrid objective. The main comparison here is with MLP. These are multi-layer perceptrons. We also have multi-layer perceptrons which use a special initialization and batch normalization tricks which are not yet available for, uh, for RAT SBN. So the fairer comparison is uh, between uh, SBNs and MLPs. And we see, yeah, you can take them and actually classify MNIST with them or, or your data set. So they are essentially like MLPs. They are data agnostic models and you can train them as classifiers. So they are pretty much on par with multi-layer perceptrons. So you can, you can decide, do you, uh, do you want to take an MLP as a classifier? Do you want to take a, a RAT SBN as a classifier? So why, why would you go with a more complicated model or like a RAT SBN, which is also somewhat slower to train? So here are some reasons why you would like to do that. So uh, while an MLP is essentially a condition distribution over your class given inputs, uh, a RAT SBN or more generally an SBN is always a joint distribution over your class and all the inputs. So what you can do is, if you get a sample, just marginalize out the class variable and you get essentially a P of X, so you get a, a probability of your inputs. Um, so, um, um, so where is this useful? For example, um, for when, you, uh, when you have missing data, uh, so when some, some of your input uh, features are missing at random, then the marginalization power of SBNs actually allows you to analy analytically or like uh, in closed form to integrate it out. So like when, when something is missing, you can just integrate it out and you get uh, still uh, a robust classification. So here we played with two data, data sets and re uh, reduced artificially the percentage of missing inputs. And so uh, all these curves except the red curve are RAT SBNs with in a different generative discriminative trade-off regime and we see that they are more, behave more robust than when you than, uh, when you do uh, classification with missing data on with uh, MLPs using dropout. So that's the first story. So you get essentially for free uh, classify, which can naturally deal with missing inputs. Uh, the second story is uh, outlier detection. So I mentioned uh, that you can compute a, a probability of your inputs. And essentially, this is very naturally suited for outlier detection. So if you feed, if you train an MNIST classifier and you feed it with an image of a chicken, then essentially the classifier can tell you, wait, this is a fishy sam sample, so I, you shouldn't trust into my prediction because that doesn't look any like uh, my, uh, my training data. And here is some uh, qualitative study. So we, we trained uh, SBANs on MNIST and passion MNIST, and now we divided all the samples into correctly classified samples and incorrectly classified samples. Then for each class, we took within uh, each of these subgroups, we looked at the sample with the highest and the lowest likelihood. And it's quite interesting what we see here, for example, in the correct, uh, uh, paying attention to MNIST, in the correct set and outliers, we see that the, although the classification was correct here, we can actually wishly confirm that these are kind of freaky, uh, uh, atypical MNIST samples. Uh, 
or if you pay attention to the, M, again, to MNIST, in the incorrect but in liar class, we see the model actually said, well, these, these, these samples look like, they look like typical data, but nevertheless, the classification was wrong. And if we look at this example, we see actually an explanation why this happened. So like the zero could also be an eight, or the six looks a lot like a one. So essentially, it seems that these are like the ambiguous samples. So uh, interesting qualitative study. We did also a more quantitative study using a framework uh, called transfer testing. So the idea is simple. Train on some domain like MNIST. This is a digit domain. And then test again on MNIST, so the inlier domain, and with alien data sets. So, uh, so Simeon and SVHN are also digit data sets, but they are quite uh, different than MNIST. So you wouldn't expect that the classifier gets the decision correct, but you would hope that this outlier detection tells you, hold on, you shouldn't trust into my prediction. So what we see in the, the, in the top pl plot is a histogram of a test likelihoods over input, so the P of X, so how likely is your input. Um, and we see that there is actually a clear separation between the inlier domain, uh, MNIST, and street view house numbers in Simeon. So actually there's a perfect separation between MNIST and Simeon, so we can perfectly distinguish between outliers and inliers, between, so MNIST and Simeon. Uh, street view house numbers and MNIST uh, overlap a bit, but it's hardly to see in, in this plot that this is actually uh, less than 1%. So we, are, we can actually, using this uh, P of X, we can distinguish almost perfectly between inlier and outlier data. And just as a sanity check, since computing this P of X is actually super simple in MNIST, uh, in, in, in SBNs, you just need to average the outputs. You can do the same computation in, in MLPs. This wouldn't have the meaning of a proper log likelihood, so we call it a mock likelihood, and this is just a sanity check that performing the same computation in an MLP does not lead to such a clear uh, outlier signal. So to wrap up, uh, we proposed a very simple approach uh, for probabilistic deep learning with a lot of benefits. So we, um, we with random SBANs, we are close to state of the art in terms of density estimation. When you use that as a classifier, you are close to MLPs, but you have certain extras like that you naturally can deal with missing data and you have outlier detection on board. So uh, there is and will be code, so there's currently a minimal version uh, uh, on GitHub. Uh, please feel free to, to play with that and we will add code in order to fully reproduce our uh, experiments in the near future. So thanks and thanks to my collaborators. Thank you.